welcome today. Thanks for coming to listen to me, and uh, hope you get something out of this conversation. Uh, I'm basically going to talk about computers for technical diving, and mostly I'm going to talk about my progression to how I ended up doing what I do with with, uh, with my computers and my diving, and how I got there, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how technical dive computers are different from uh, recreational computers. For those of you um, who've heard me speak before, this presentation is a bit unusual, as I normally present evidence from other fields and and try to apply it to rebreather diving and find ways to uh, find lessons from other technology. Um, in this presentation, this is really going to be all opinion. There's not, no, no facts to back up anything I say here. Um, and it's just what I think and what I've, what I've gone through. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about a little bit is what, what do decompression computers really do? There are dissolved gases in our blood all the time. As we're standing here, we have a, a, about uh, partial pressure of nitrogen in our in our tissues of about 0.79. And as we change the ambient pressure by going underwater, the amount of dissolved uh, gases in our in our bloodstream in our bodies changes. So if we are um, above the ambient pressure line, we're off gassing. For example, if we if we were um, at altitude, for example, uh, we'll off gas. If, we, if the ambient pressure is greater than the pressure of the tissues in our body, we will then on gas. And one of the goals of decompression is to not off-gas explosively. So what the idea is that we're trying to, and you probably saw this, a lot of people saw something like this in their, in their open water class. What we're trying to do is, is turn the, um, the nitrogen in your blood or the helium from a dissolved state to a gaseous state uh, in a controlled way. One of the misconceptions is, the, is that, you know, we were actually trying to make you not bubble. And that really isn't true. It, it's quite normal for, for you to have bubbles in your blood uh, during decompression. And, and actually, it's probably a good sign of a good decompression. And there's absolutely no correlation at this point uh, between low-level uh, low level blood, uh, low-level bubbles in your blood and decompression sickness. So the, the goal of a dive computer is to try and keep you in the safe de decompression zone. So we want to be able to uh, take you to a position where, and of course, as I'm sure all of you know, there's a, uh, there are a number of theoretical tissues within your body that don't relate to any uh, particular um, actual tissues, but they have different rates of on-gassing and off-gassing, mainly based on perfusion and density. So, for example, bone is a very slow tissue, both on-gassing and off-gassing. Uh, it's typically and really perfused. If you look at the, um, what, a, what a technical dive computer has to do that's different from what a recreational computer does is basically a recreational computer, your time to surface calculation is just go to the surface at 30 feet per minute. It's a straight line. You, there's actually a calculation called the Schreiner equation where you can do it in one step. It's very, very simple to calculate. As soon as you get into technical diving, you actually have to plan the profile, and you have to have quite a lot of information about the profile in order to provide a reasonable time to surface. And, and it, it's not automatic. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of some computers that don't actually provide a very accurate time to surface. Um, because what we need to do is we need to know uh, what gases you're going to use and which depths you're going to change at them and what, how your PO2 is going to vary uh, for one uh, during your decompression and, of course, be able to allow for close circuit rebreathers. As you'll notice here, this is, the, the, uh, this is a different kind of dive from, from a recreational dive because we're switching gases here. So this all has to be built in. If you want to predict what the time is when the diver is going to reach here, you have to calculate this equation or this uh, set of steps. And there is no one-step equation to do that. There's no equivalent to the Schreiner equation. It's something you have to calculate in real time. And you have to do it quickly because you wouldn't think that that would be much of a challenge for computers and, and you know, for, certainly for a laptop it's not, but you have a direct correlation between power consumption and processing power and uh, it's very easy to see computers that, uh, or to make computers that um, can't update this fast enough for it to be useful. And in fact, most of the time, just, just a little secret on the, the manufacturing of dive computers, 
The computer sits and does this calculation 99% of the time. 1% of the time is everything else. This is really what dive computers do, is they sit and they recalculate time to surface over and over and over again. Um, <clears throat> so we have to make predictions on how to do this, and how it's going to happen, and settings for that. And of course, all this comes into, you have to do it in a way that this user finds easy to understand. So we need to, uh, we need to know when these gas switches are going to occur, and, and what gases are going to carry in all the times for it. This is just a reminder of why we do this stuff. This is a great little dive. It's, uh, this is in Truck Lagoon, and there's a ship lying on its, on its side, and you swim down, swim into the focusal, and down this very, very, very silty uh, hallway, and you bring your camera up into the compartment, and it's just inches deep in this, uh, in, in silt everywhere. So you basically, as you move your camera up, you try not to generate enough silt so that you can still get the picture. It's, uh, Thing to do. And of course, anytime the work that I talk about dive computers, we all always need to look into urinals to find our solutions. This is, this is a, a urinal in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. There's a problem with men's urinals, I hear, that men aren't that good at aiming, and there's a, there's a requirement to have cleaners come in on a regular basis to, to clean up. And um, so they were looking for a solution for this, and one of the things that, that, that came up, that somebody came up with this great idea, is paint a picture of a fly in the bottom of the urinal and give the men something to aim at. And they actually studied this and said there's 80% less spillage by giving the men the fly to aim at. And, and the reason I love this is it's a simple solution. I mean, we can all think of all sorts of different complicated solutions to this problem, more cleaners. You know, it's a simple solution that solves the problem. And, and I love looking for solutions like that with, with uh, our programs. When you're looking at dive computers, some people will start going through a feature comparison. Comparison. This is a real picture of Microsoft Word with all the toolbars turned on. So I think this makes a pretty good argument that more features isn't necessarily better and doesn't make things easier to operate. We would prefer to do something like this. We would prefer to give you less for your money. Because we think this is the sort of system that you really want. You really don't want 45 buttons. They're produced that way because it's cheaper for the manufacturer to make one system and have it work for everybody than it is to make a system for every individual need. Again, we believe that if you're going to do technical diving and rebreather diving, you want to have a rebreather computer or a technical diving computer that is designed for the purpose and has exactly those functions that you need and not a lot of functions that you don't need so that it's easy to operate and particularly I, I sometimes think that, that many things are designed, many computers are designed for people, for the programmers. So the programmer sitting at a desk and he's got good light and he's warm and he's relaxed, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's used to working with computers all the time. And he says, there's, there's an old computer, I can't even remember who used to make it, but it was like you had to do three short push, pushes and then two long and then hold it. And it was like only a programmer could think that that's a, use, a usable feature. But there the really was, I, can't, I wish I remember what that one was. But it didn't last very long. But that's not what we're dealing with. When you're on a rebreather and you're at 100 meters and you have decompression and you have... Um, uh, you may be cold, you have, may have some narcosis, you may have some stress. That's not the right time to be trying to figure out how your computer works. So the computer should be paying a lot of attention to exactly what state you're in right now and doing things that are appropriate for what you're doing right this minute. One of the things that, 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 that we use, and this is called a training transfer, um, and I have to give, this, give credit to this to uh, Tracy Robinette, who was actually one of the organizers of Rebreather Re 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 2. Um, and that is radio station gases. We were having a discussion once about how to, how to interpret gases. So you have five open circuit gases, five closed circuit gases. You can switch between them. You can add them, delete them, and edit them. And it's a, it's a, the, the, a car radio is a perfect metaphor for it. What I can do, because you understand how car radios work, I can, in a couple of minutes, explain to you how our gases work. And without even telling you specific things, you already know how, you, how they're going to how they work on our system because you know how car radio works. So I don't even have to explain all their functions. 
you already know most of these data. Um, of course, you never want to have a technical dive computer that does lockout. There, there are a bunch of reasons for that. I, um, the, pretty much every um, uh, recreational computer will lock you out if you even miss a stop even by a minute, but that's not what we want with technical diving because what's going to happen, I mean, anybody who's been on a technical diving uh, expedition on a, on a boat or on shore and you're in Grand Cayman doing these walls, I guarantee you the guy's going to dive the next day, even if he missed five minutes of decompression because of marine traffic or, you know, some other sort of situation. And they're going to mitigate it somehow. They're going to breathe oxygen for half an hour after their dive, or they're going to you know, do an afternoon, very shallow dive, 20-foot dive, uh, you know, on a high oxygen content. But they're going diving the next day, and it's just, I think it's the responsibility of a technical diving computer to give you its best estimate for what the next dive looks like. Reliability is, a, is, a, is another feature, and in some industries, reliability is actually safety. If you look at some of the standards, the way they're written, they really are all about uh, uh, reliability. And in, in simple places, reliability is safety. So if you have a steam boiler, for example, and it has an overpressure valve, as long as that overpressure valve is reliable, that is a complete solution. You, know, you don't have to go any further than that. Reliability is safety. With, with other more complex devices, that's not quite so true, but reliability you know, if we look at a lighthouse, I mean, what, what, what makes a, light, a lighthouse add safety? And what, the way it adds safety is in marking shoals or rocks. But the reason it's valuable is because it works, because it's there, because time after time when you're coming back to port, the light is there. If it was only there 50% of the time, it would be a lot less safe. And actually, people would find other ways to work. The compression algorithms. Actually, this is good. There was actually a presentation this morning that backed up what I was going to say in here, so that's good. Um, this was a, a slide put up by Richard Pyle uh, at a, a Deep Stops conference in 2001. And I, I love the statement here, this one here. How much of this variation is just noise? I mean, how much do we really know about this? Should we, you know, I see, I see, I was a decompression diver that used to use stopwatches at my stops. As I learned more about decompression, I realized that that was not a very sensible thing to do, that the science, you know, look at, look at the variations here. The science is nowhere near the point where a stopwatch is important on stops. These are, at best, approximations of what your decompression should look like. And if you look at the difference in times here, it's actually quite stunning, 151 minutes to 99 minutes. Um, and people were diving these, although I, nobody, I don't think anybody dives at the straight BPM anymore. They're moving on BPM too. But, this shows the variation of various decompression algorithms, and I, I, I'd just like to mention that, that now it appears that the, the, the data is going further and further that we really don't want to be doing uh, deeper stops necessarily, but we definitely want to be extending our shallow stops. And that's something that, that uh, is, is coming up from real data in a number of different places and anecdotally. Uh, finding a, lot of, a lot of people finding that, that that little bit of niggles or sore wrist or skin rash or whatever, just adding another 5 or 10 minutes at, at your um, 10 to 20 foot stop makes a big difference. So these are some of the features that, uh, that I think that you should be looking for in technical diving computers. I'm not going to read that out to you, I'm sure you guys can all read. So I, I, I suppose I'm a little bit biased in the, in the way I see this because I, when I started diving there were no technical computers. And I, I got to tell you, with the first person that did a technical computer, we all celebrated. Um, we would start off by doing a plan on some sort of program, and then we would copy it into our books, and we would then calculate all of the uh, uh, um, detailed data ourselves. The program would typically give that to you, but we would calculate it anyway because that's what our instructors wanted us to do. And I think that's invaluable because you get to a point where you really see something and you know it's wrong. Just by looking at it, you know it's wrong. If your 10-foot stop is shorter than your 20-foot than your, than your stop, you just know that's wrong because that never happens in real life. So 
having this information available to you can be really useful in emergencies. And I have to say, I have had that happen to me. I was, um, I was a safety diver on a free diving event, and we were quite deep. I don't remember how deep. But they pulled the line up in the middle of my decompression. I'm holding on to it, and it's like this line shoots up, and I, I start to lose depth. depth. Of course, my computer at this moment decides to have the depth sensor fail. And it's like, oh, wonderful. I'm in midwater, and I have no depth sensor. My other depth sensor is in my pocket. I've got a spare, a spare bottom pattern in my pocket. But, you know, it's very hard to reach it while I'm trying to figure out whether I'm going up or down and get stabilized. So I got stabilized, and then all I had was a bottom timer with me. I had no decompression. But if you've done this enough times, that's not a big problem. You, you can figure out pretty close what your decompression is. I mean, you've done the dive enough times that, that um, you have a pretty good idea. Of course, you end up doing a lot more decompression to be safe. But. So in the early days when we were just doing nitrox decompression, it was really easy to just carry a table like this. It gives you all the alternatives you need. Basically, that's everything, every possible dive you could go on. And then the dives got more complicated. And we started to, I can't believe this is the best picture I could find on the internet of a slate with a bottom timer. I, I would think that the thought, would have thought there would be thousands of them. Ugh, sorry. Um, so as the dives got more complicated, we had helium in them now. Now you can only plan a few dives. So you'd have three or four or six you know, outcomes. And then I got one of these. And this really confounded everything because this is a funny rebreather in that it has two diluents. So it has air and heliox, or, or pure helium. So the way you would dive it was, you would, you would dive uh, an air diluent down to whatever depth you wanted to have your, as your maximum narcotic depth. You would then pull the lever, and it would switch the computer and the physical tank to a heliox or a helium mix. And as you continue to descend, your partial pressure of nitrogen would stay the same. And uh, there were, at that time, uh, the CCR, uh, the, um, um, this lunar also did the same thing. Those were the only two devices that actually did partial, partial pressure nitrogen, constant PN2 as well as constant PO2. The problem this creates is that none of the dive tables even can even calculate that. I mean, you, you, you can't buy any program to calculate your decompression. Um, you, uh, your decompression is done with the, the onboard device because it's the only one that knows how to do it. So everything else becomes, becomes estimates. But the other thing that rebreathers do is that they kind of blow the whole idea of dive planning. What happens with a rebreather is that you don't have a, a dive plan so much as you have a maximum dive envelope. That if you stay within these de depths and times, you know that you've got decompression, you've got sufficient gas for bailout and all those sorts of issues. So it's really a, a whole set of dives that, that are all planned exactly the same on a rebreather based on how much bailout you're carrying and how much decompression you're willing to do. As I said, when this first came out, I got one of the very first ones, and this was a wonderful thing for tech diving. This is the beginning of tech diving computers. And as we moved on to expedition-type diving, where you're doing a series of dives, over, oh, you were on that boat, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, while, uh, while we're doing a series of dives each day, it becomes virtually impossible to do tables in a situation like this. Because realistically, what you have to do each day then is you have to plan your dive for the day. Then after the dive, you have to go back and enter the dive you actually dived. And with rebreathers, that could be a very bizarre dive. It could be uh, go to the bottom and spend hours coming up on a reef. And, you know, you really don't even have a good idea of what the depths were. It's not like you're doing a square dive. And you would have to do that for each dive and keep this running table. And frankly, it just becomes impossible. So I think once you get into the idea of doing multi-day decompression diving, you pretty much are stuck with using computers. So I put a thread up on uh, DecoStop a while ago. Why not use a computer? And got some interesting ideas. Because some people, believe it or not, there are people that, that do uh, closed circuit decompression diving and don't use computers. I mean, I, I think it makes a lot of work for yourself myself, but there are people that do it. Um, I think the biggest one here is understanding. And if at all possible, that, that's one of the things if you're going to start diving, and, and I think it's going to start happening more and more. People aren't really going to do much open circuit training. They're going to move right into a rebreather. 
And I wonder, you know, if, whether we'll, whether people will get enough experience understanding decompression and understanding the factors that are that are affecting them and being able to have some idea what to do in the case of failures. Um, so I think the biggest probable, probable reason to not use a computer is to at least spend some time planning your dies manually and then, and then I'll move on to a computer. Yeah, some people are using ratio deco and doing decompression dives uh, without a computer on a, on a closed circuit rebreather. Not something that I would uh, be interested in doing, but it's certainly something that people do. So, if you're a new rebreather diver, and I don't know, I, I think this audience is a lot more educated than I was expecting when I did this presentation. I, I think probably pretty much everybody here is a rebreather diver already. So, but by all means, my best recommendation would be to take the time to know how the planning tools are developing your, uh, your, your various numbers, how they're calculating them so that you have some idea what's going on when things don't go right. <sighs> and so what have I evolved to now? Uh, basically I wear uh, one computer uh, that's connected to my rebreather. I have a heads-up display for my backup PO2. I have a second computer, which is not plugged into my rebreather that I use for uh, decompression as well. And I use a buddy. We, uh, I have a dive buddy, and we dive together all the time, and we stay together all the time. And so between us, we have four computers. And often we have them set differently so that we, we're doing spans or ranges, or ranges so that I can actually, we, we have a selection of, of profiles available. and. Uh, and uh, I think that we're pretty well covered with that, and we don't carry anything printed. That's just me. Any questions? Sometimes, actually, when I see when I see the monkey here, you know, there's a story about monkeys that uh, uh, there, there were five monkeys put in a cage, and they were uh, kept there, and they put food in on a string above a, a bench like this. But every time the monkeys went to try and get the banana, they would spray them with cold water. And after a while, they had the, the monkeys all trained not to, uh, not to go for the banana. Then they changed one monkey with a new monkey, and they brought him in, and of course he went for the banana, and all the other monkeys stopped him because they didn't want to get sprayed with the water. And this kept going, they changed in one, and they changed another one, and pretty soon they changed all five of the monkeys. So none of the monkeys had actually ever been sprayed with water, but they were all trained to not go for the banana. And that's why some people still dive open circuit. Um, and I think it's only a matter of time before that moves over to dive computers. 